Good afternoon. It's the 2 o'clock hour. Welcome to Spiritual Journey with Suda on WXAC 91.3 FM. We're here on the Albright College campus in Reading, Pennsylvania, and it's a beautiful, mostly sunny day, 77 degrees. We're just getting things set up. Just getting things set up, as this is the inaugural program for Spiritual Journey. Um, and so, I'm going to welcome everyone and just take a moment to center. So, if you're in a safe place to do so, please close your eyes and focus on your breath. Otherwise, just focus on one or two mindful breaths with your eyes open. As you're breathing, allow yourself to connect. And as you are connecting, allow yourself to feel present to that connection, grounded and peaceful. Allow yourself to be open to the experience of peace. Continue focusing on the breath moving in and out of the body and on the aliveness that travels with that breath. Say to yourself silently, I am present. I am here. I am mindful. I am spiritual. I am. And just take another more breath, one more breath in and one more breath out. And then we'll begin this amazing journey with an intention. And the intention is to serve the community, the listening community, to support your journey toward a happier, more peace-filled life through a deep and meaningful inquiry into the essence of spirituality. And so as we continue now, you can open your eyes if in fact they were closed. And we'll begin today's conversation talking about what this program is and the type of information that we'll be covering. And so the title of the show is Spiritual Journey. And so we are going to talk about all things spiritual, and that includes everything from spiritual practices, spiritual pathways, mindfulness, meditation, yoga. Uh, we'll talk a bit about some other practices that are similar to yoga, including Tai Chi and Qigong. We'll talk about what it is to take good care of yourself, what it is to take good care of your family, good care of your community, how to nourish, how to really nourish and feed the self in a way that is enhancing your aliveness. And so the first thing that we'll kind of ask is, what is mindfulness? Because mindfulness is such an important component of your spirituality. Well, mindfulness is the practice of being present on purpose, more as a witness, less as a participant. Participation is mindful when it is present. Otherwise, we're just kind of watching. You know, you go to the movies and You've been waiting for a certain movie to come out, and you sit and you watch the movie, and you're not participating in the movie, you're watching the movie. And then if you enjoyed the movie, or if you didn't, you go home to your friends and family, and you report on what it is that you saw. You tell them enthusiastically, this is what I experienced as a witness. Or you tell them, maybe don't spend your money on that movie ticket, might not quite be worth that um, amount that you would pay. Either way, you're paying attention on purpose to something that is outside of yourself. And so mindfulness can be paying attention on purpose outside of yourself. So looking at the world and the things that are happening um, around you. In spirituality, mindfulness is also paying attention to the inner world. Sitting down or standing up, walking in your activities from day to day, no matter what they are, uh, recognizing uh, what is happening within you? What are your reactions and responses to moment-to-moment -moment stimulations, uh, to arguments and to laughter, to stress, to tension, and to relaxation? How are you interacting with these qualities in your day-to-day -day life? And so we want to watch our interactions, watch the way that we are experiencing life and learn from them. So mindfulness is paying attention on purpose. It's a non-judgmental presence. It's not that we're judging and saying this is good, that is good, this is bad, that is bad. 
We're just paying attention in order to learn about what is. Maintaining a moment-by-moment awareness of our thoughts, our feelings, our sensations, our environment through the lens of compassion. So compassion is another really important component in spirituality. Non-judgmentalism is based in compassion, and mindfulness is also based in compassion. So we sit and we look and we recognize that, you know, Maybe yesterday I judged a lot. Maybe last year I judged a lot. But today I recognize that the universal truth is that all people are suffering. And the other universal truth is that all people want to be happy. And because I understand those things, maybe I can hold a bit more space for people, for those around me, and for the processes that happen in the world. Maybe with that compassion, I can learn how to judge less accept more, and hold space more effectively. Tune in to what we are presently sensing in the moment rather than rehashing the past or imagining and worrying about the future. And it really does come down to a practice. So mindfulness is a practice. You know, it's a a day-to-day, hour-to-hour, minute-to-minute, moment-to-moment practice of coming back to what is, not getting lost in the distractions. A practice. And as many of the great teachers of spirituality through time have said, and as is stated in the Patanjali Yoga Sutras of of yoga, which we'll be talking about as well, um, a practice is most effective when it is conducted over a long period of time with little to no interruption and great enthusiasm. So over a long period of time, sometimes we try to make a little change in life, you know, maybe we decide, well, I'm going to be a a kinder person, a more patient person, and two days go by, something happens, gets under our skin, we lose our patience, and we say, I've been doing this for two days, how come I'm not more patient? Well, because it has to happen over a period of time, not a day or two days, but over a longer period, maybe even years, you know, we have to cultivate the change over time. And also with little to no interruption. So as best we can, being consistent about our practice. So if kindness is our practice, finding places in our day-to-day life on a consistent basis where kindness can be practiced to others, to ourself, so that we're always thinking about kindness. And when we're always thinking about kindness, then the thing we're not thinking about is its opposite. We're not investing in harm. We're not investing in judgment. We're not investing in cruelties. Instead, we're putting our energy toward thinking about and practicing kindness. And then with great enthusiasm, you know, because enthusiasm is such an important thing. If we go about something in a bit of a a lackluster way, then our results are going to reflect that. If we go about a practice of kindness or a practice of yoga or Tai Chi or our academic studies or our day-to-day career in a lackluster manner, then what we're going to experience will be lackluster results. And those results will cause us to feel doubt, to feel sad, to feel disappointed, and that's going to diminish our compassion, diminish our enthusiasm even more, And we'll start questioning if we should even continue um, with the practice. So really important that our practice be conducted over a long period of time, little to no interruption, and with great enthusiasm. So just kind of recapping the mindfulness. It is the practice of being present on purpose, a bit more as a witness versus a participant, and there is a non-judgmentalism to it. So we're not looking and saying, you see, I told you. I told you so. Instead, we're just looking. We're saying, what is happening here? What is present in this moment with me? And how am I interacting with it? And our mindfulness uh, surrounds our thoughts, feelings, sensations, and our environment. And compassion is such an important key. So mindfulness is kind of the basis for spirituality. And so what some people might be asking now is, well, what is spirituality? There's many definitions for spirituality. Some people associate spirituality with religion, and it's definitely a component of religion, but it's actually much simpler than that. 
According to uh, our dictionary, uh, spirituality is the quality of being concerned with the human spirit or soul as opposed to material and physical things. So basically, according to the dictionary that you and I refer to on a regular basis, um, spirituality is our being concerned with the inherent happiness of life and with the inner uh, wellness of our being and of of all other beings, human and non-human. Spirituality, uh, in this instance, is about connecting. And in order to know what it is that we're connecting with, we need to practice mindfulness. So the mindfulness and the spirituality go hand in hand with each other. In the uh, yoga teachings, particularly in Patanjali Yoga Sutras, as well as in a book called the Bhagavad Gita, one of the first ethics that are talked about is nonviolence. And so when we're practicing concern for uh, the well-being of humans and non-humans, uh, one of the first things in spirituality that we can start to discuss and to um, to take a really deep look at is the ways in which we are violent, the ways in which we harm people, and we can start making you know changes uh, to our behavior, to our lifestyle that allow us and allow our behavior to support a more complete wellness in this world, in our community, in our family, and in ourself. So really important to know that this being concerned with the human spirit and soul as opposed to materialism and you know physical objects really includes this kind of a commitment on some level uh, to the practice of nonviolence, non-harming, which in yoga is called ahimsa. In Psychology Today, which is a pretty popular magazine, they define spirituality as being better thought of as a boundaryless dimension of human experience. As such, it must be admitted. It is not open to the normal methodologies of scientific investigation. It cannot be completely defined. It cannot be pinned down. So no matter how much we really try to... Um, get a concrete definition for the word spirituality, it's really going to mean something different to many different people. It's going to mean the practice of religion to those who are religious. Um, to those who are animal activists, it will be about the humaneness of our behaviors toward animals. To environmentalists, it will have to do with our relationship with the world um, just depends on who we are, the way that we define it, and none of them are wrong. That's the beauty of spirituality. Spirituality is all-encompassing, so not one of those definitions is wrong. None of them are complete, because spirituality is about aliveness. It is about the essence of our being alive, and it's not something that can be measured, so we can't really say, I'm more spiritual than you are in some part because we never know what's going on in the mind of another person, and in another part because we don't know how they're measuring spirituality, and maybe we don't even know how we're measure, measuring spirituality. Um, there's no uniformity to it other than this genuine concern for well-being. So spirituality, as I like to look at it, is aliveness. It's the essence of life, and it is also the essence of religion. It's the essence of everything that is meaningful, truly meaningful to ourselves, to our souls, to our hearts, to our minds, but not to our ego necessarily. The ego, when it's not balanced, is a tool that actually fights against our experience of spirituality and invests itself in suffering. So we want to look at our ego, that is the self-invested portion of our mind, as being something that when it's healthy, it can contribute greatly to our true happiness. But when it's not healthy, it takes us away from that happiness and puts us into predicaments uh, where violence and harm have the potential to uh, occur. So spirituality is aliveness, and it's the essence of life. It's the essence of religion. It's the essence of being itself. Um, but still, the extent to which one practices or acknowledges this is a highly personal choice, and there is no right or wrong in that choice. That's a big statement, and that's a statement that uh, many people would potentially disagree with, and I'm okay with that. But really, spirituality is ultimately about freedom. 
You know, it's about the freedom of yourself to experience this life that you find yourself in and to do what you can with it, to realize the potential goodness that exists within your own heart. And your path to that expression is going to look different than my path to that expression. And it's going to look different from someone else's path. So the greatest thing that we can do for each other is to hold a space of compassion so that we can each walk the path, walk the path of spirituality, walk the path of peace, walk the path of goodness as we feel we can in any moment given the tools that we believe we have. So spirituality is just such an amazing practice. And, you know, spirituality um, is something that has been with humans uh, potentially since the days that human beings first put their hands in the okra, uh, stained their hands and placed their handprints on the walls of caves in France and other areas of the world from the hieroglyphics from, from ancient times where people just really longed for expression and they wanted to leave some kind of, of a signature that they existed. I existed and it matters that I existed. And this is a huge question in spirituality, the meaning of being here. So such a beautiful thing to think about that throughout time, for as long as there have been human beings, we have on one level all sought the same exact thing, purpose. Purpose in life, the expression of our being, and to know that we matter. Such, an, such a, a beautiful journey that we're on. What is this expression of purpose? Well, in yoga, we call that dharma. And there's a few different levels of dharma. Um, and so I know we're covering so much information today. So don't worry. We're going to keep going over this many, many times in many different formats for the coming weeks of this uh, radio show. But dharma means duty. And so on the first level, what is our duty as a householder, as a person who has a family, who is a member of a community, who is a student or a teacher, um, who who has a, a job and is a member of that community, um, who's raising children? What is our responsibility there? That would be one level of dharma, that we take that responsibility, that ability to respond to day-to-day circumstances seriously and that we infuse as much good intention in those responsibilities as possible. The second level of dharma is um, a bit more complicated and also a little easier. It's kind of an interesting uh, dynamic. Dharma is also simply the wisdom of the universe. It is the wisdom of the universe, and we can see this expressing itself in nature around us. But before we go any further with the uh, expression of wisdom in the universe. It's time for my PSA announcement. So, I'm just going to grab the folder here and tell you a little something that's coming up. On September 25th, we have uh, Adventure Days, Rock Wall Climbing, Boulder Challenge, and Zip Line at South Mountain YMCA Camps in Reinolds, from 2 p.m. to 4 p.m. On September 26th, we have the 140th Annual uh, Firemen's Conference at Little Swatara Church of the Brethren in Bethel, which is an all-day event, and that's pretty impressive. It's the 140th Annual Firemen's Conference. Wow. Um, Additionally, Everybody by Brandon Jacobs Jenkins, directed by Joey Love um, at Albright College Wachovia Theater, from 8 p.m. to 10 p.m. on September 26th. And then on September 27th, Seeds to Sprouts Harvest Salibration at the Angora Fruit Farm in Reading from 6 p.m. to 7 p.m. So there's a couple of things that are coming up in your community that you might want to come out and support. So coming back to this question of Dharma now. So Dharma, again, you know, one level of Dharma is the responsibility that we have as members of this society, as members of a family, um, as an individual in bringing forth the goodness and in accepting um, our role, whatever role it is that we uh, step into and committing ourselves to fulfilling that role in the most positive, growth-inspiring way possible. The second definition of dharma is um, this universal conscious wisdom. And 
one of the ways that we can explain this is to say we can look at nature and we can see that nature has her natural cycles and those cycles are not personal. She just does what she does and she keeps renourishing herself and regrowing herself and expressing herself in a way that is not purposefully harmful to anyone. Yes, there are things like storms that come along and they can, you know, they can wipe our house clean. Um, they can be pretty destructive, but they're not destructive in a way that is um, on purpose. They're not destructive in a way that is based in hate or prejudice or intentional harm. They just are what they are. And so we can look at these natural patterns that occur in nature and we can look at the wisdom that exists there. So what I mean by that is this, the last time that you caused harm, that you caused harm intentionally, what would have happened if you didn't? What would have happened? What road would you have taken? What alternative would you have considered if you understood that harm was in in control of that situation within your own ego? How would you have decided differently? And what are the possibilities of resolution that could have come forward as a result of taking action that is based in compassion, in love, in also a sense of impersonalness, um, rather than taking action based in hate, anger, jealousy, distrust, dislike, um, or some other type of judgment. It's a really big topic, and it's not one that's easily uh, talked about in, in a one-hour radio show or in a many, many-hour radio show. It's something that you know has been being talked about for a millennia, more than that. You know, The concept of dharma goes back several thousand years, and people are still disagreeing about exactly what it means. But I like to look at things from a practical perspective. So one of the things that I look at and say is, well, if I'm looking out at nature and I'm seeing that nature doesn't commit acts against me personally, nature doesn't do that. So the wisdom there is that I should also not commit acts of a personal nature to harm other people. If I commit an act and I don't intend it to be harmful, but it does cause harm, then I'll have to have some type of resolution to that but if i commit acts that are based in violence and i know that and i'm committing them out of hate and i'm committing them out of out of prejudice or or out of jealousy then i'm going to have so much that has to be resolved starting with a sense of guilt and guilt is a major major inhibitor of spiritual expression because the more we feel guilty the more our self-esteem is assaulted and the more our self-esteem is assaulted the more likely we are to commit continuous acts of harm and violence so in spirituality this idea of not taking things personally is so important don't take things personally when people are upset don't take things personally when you know someone is is giving you um, some criticism instead listen to what's being said understood that this individual has uh concerns, considerations, ideas, and objectives, all their own that have nothing whatsoever to do with you. All you have to do is listen openly and then walk away and take from it what you will. And what's not useful to you, you can leave it behind because you don't have to accept it as the truth. All you can do as a spiritualist is hold space for it to be expressed. And then don't take offense. Don't take offense. And I know in my own life, I found that to be so very helpful, that people have expectations all the time, and you can't meet everybody's expectations. All you can do is come from a place of genuine authenticity within yourself. But remember, that authenticity is not harmful. So it's not saying to another person, hey, I've got something to tell you about what you're doing wrong. No, your authenticity and your own authentic expression of life is about your goodness It's about coming forward in a way that is healthy and whole and integrating and full of insights and wisdom. So if you look at Dharma from these two perspectives, what we find is that is a pretty big responsibility. Uh, Dharma is no small matter. 
And yet people walk around all the time using that word as if it were some, you know, uh, small, meaningless uh, joke. And it's actually not. It's saying that you have been born into this life, so take this life by the reins and allow yourself to express your potential, your potential growth, your potential goodness, your potential light, your potential love. And in those moments where you are making choices to the contrary, then accept the responsibility of those choices fully. Understand that there will be consequences to pay and be willing to to work with those consequences to come to a resolution. And you'll find that growth is something that will will be an, in abundance within your experience of this life. So coming back to coming back to this conversation of of, of spirituality um, and also looking at Dharma, we can ask ourselves, well, how do how do we know that Dharma is like real? You know, how do we know that there is such a thing as Dharma? What is it? What is it that informs this discussion of Dharma? Well, no matter who you ask, you can turn to any person around you right now and ask them a simple question. Ask them, say, what do you want in this life? What is the one, one thing that your heart longs for in this life? And on some level, they will say to be happy. Every single person I have ever met, without exception, has always answered this question when asked that all they really want is to be happy happy they don't want to suffer they want to be able to take care of their family they want to have a community of friends that they're like-minded with they want to be able to uh to put down their burden all these answers culminate to this one i just want to be happy so what are the what are the uh imposing factors against happiness what stops us from being happy well harm and violence stop us from being happy I mean, that's really what it comes down to. We can't be happy and be harmful in the same moment. We will not find happiness if we are violent in the same moment. It's not possible. And the other thing to think about there is that happiness is a form of health. Happiness is a form of health. And you know that you're healthy when you are not interested in hurting people. Healthy people do not hurt people. Healthy people do not harm people. Healthy people support people, and healthy people support happiness. So we have this this concept of happiness that everybody is looking for. But one of the things that we uh, become distracted or mistaken by is this idea that happiness exists somewhere outside of ourself. Happiness does not exist outside of ourself. You can't go to the corner store and buy it. All you can do is live it and be it and express it. You have to find it inside of yourself. It's the only place that it really is. There's no car, no clothing, no money. There's not even another person who is going to make you happy. You have to make that choice for yourself. So when we say, I just want to be happy, what we're also saying, whether we know it or not, is I really want to dig deep inside of myself and find out what it is that I'm doing how it is I'm behaving, thinking, believing that is stifling my experience of happiness, of true happiness. And what we will consistently come back to is that the stifling factor, the thing that is stopping us from being happy, is violence and harm and our tendency to commit violent, harmful acts against others. So what is a violent, harmful act? And that's a really loaded question, right? Because there's all different levels of violence and there's all different levels of harm. Um, you know, you'll punch somebody, that's obviously violence. You know, if you have a gun and you shoot somebody, that's obviously violence. You steal from somebody, that's obviously violent and harmful. But what about the small things? What about laughing when someone falls down? What about um, ridiculing someone? What about passive aggressiveness? These are all violent and harmful as well. You know, I, I, I like what my teacher, so my teacher uh, is from India. He is a monk of 50 years. Uh, I've been studying with him now for about 13 years. And he says, MYOB, mind your own business. He says, if you don't have something nice to say, something good and positive and uplifting, if you can't reflect the goodness that exists within your own heart, and even if you can, MYOB is the best way to go. Just mind your own business. Don't 
ridicule other people. Don't try to get in and fix them and fix their situation. If another person is in a situation, they're there because they need to learn from that situation. And the best thing that we can do for them is to support their learning by not manipulating it for them. So just kind of coming back for a moment, though, so what is a mindful harmful act is imposition, manipulation. These are also mindful, uh, these are also violent harmful acts. Um, manipulating other people to to fulfill some kind of a need that we think that we have that they, only they can fulfill or to cause us to feel powerful somehow. So maybe today we can all kind of take a look at our relationships and how we're conducting them and we can look honestly because honesty is so important in our spiritual practices we can ask ourselves am i being manipulative in this relationship or am i being humble humble is the opposite of manipulative humble leaves space it leaves space for growth and expression to be humble means that you understand you don't have all the answers and you don't have all the power, and you shouldn't, um, that there needs to be enough for everybody. And so humbly, we step back. So how are we conducting our relationships, manipulatively or humbly? Are we holding space with compassion, or are we impatient and harmful? And as we're looking at that, we can begin to make decisions based on what we see. We don't need to make judgments about ourselves. We don't need to say things like, oh my God, there I go again. I can't believe it. I'm just a horrible person. This doesn't play to spirituality. This is a completely different issue. Um, Spirituality asks for you to see honestly and behave better. Just behave better. Just become the person that you know in your heart you are, which is a good person. And we can start this by looking at our relationships with others, defining or determining, rather, which relationships need to have a little bit of work so that we are less manipulative and less harmful. Not worrying about what the other person is doing because your spirituality is not about what they're doing. It's about what you're doing. And then just start making better choices a little bit at a time as you can, um, as you acquire the tools to make better choices. Just making these choices one at a time, taking a breath in and a breath out, You know, they did some scientific studies a while ago, and they said um, individuals who breathe in and breathe out between one and three times before making a decision about a circumstance tend to report feeling better about their decision than individuals who simply have knee-jerk reactions. Isn't that something? I mean, all we have to do is take a breath. We're doing it anyway. You know, we're breathing anyway, but breathing mindfully, knowing I am breathing in and knowing I am breathing out. And in those moments, everything will change. In a matter of one to three breaths, it will all change. And your ideas will change and your beliefs will change. And then you'll look at the situation from a different perspective. And maybe the new perspective will be a perspective that empowers both you and the person or people that you're dealing with so that they can come to a better resolution themselves. And we can have a a deeper, more meaningful resolution as well. So, so many things to talk about, but relationships are key, you know, because everything in life is a relationship. And it's not just about relationships with other people also. When we're looking at this, we also need to look and say, how am I conducting my relationship with myself? In what ways am I violent or harmful to me? When I look in the mirror, what do I see? How do I treat myself? Do I think I'm not worthy or worth it? Do I look at myself and see someone who doesn't have meaning or purpose in this life? Do I feel lost and alone? I mean, these are some pretty big questions, but they have to be addressed. They need to be looked at, especially if we're going to come into the fullness of our spiritual nature. We need to understand that the way we treat other people is most certainly based in the way we treat ourself. And that unless we love ourself, and unless we care for ourself, and unless we come into a kinder and more meaningful relationship with ourself, then our relationship with all other people is going to be stressed. Certainly there will be times where we are caring and loving, but there will also be times where we are impatient, aggravated, 
short-tempered, and uh, ready to throw in the towel. So coming into a relationship with oneself that has to do with acceptance and kindness. Um, and so for starters, let's talk about how we, f- how we feed ourselves. You know, do we see that we are worthy of good food? Do we see that the food that we're going to eat um, is something that is literally, literally going to become part of our body, part of our mind, part of this human biological construction of a person that that apple or or those fried french fries, which are very good, by the way, but too many of them, maybe not. Um, that these things, that as we eat them, <clears throat> they're actually going to become part of us. And so look at the qualities of an apple, fresh, off of the tree, nice and ripe, um, energizing, balanced. And look at the deep fried french fries, <clears throat> especially if we add cheese on top. You know, Then you have something that's a little bit more dense, a little bit slower, a little bit uh, sluggish. So... Which one? Which one is the personality that you want to express? Have the french fries, but not at every meal, you know? And maybe half the cheese. Have an apple. And have an apple at least once a day. Because the essence and the qualities that are in the apple are the essence and the qualities that you bring in into your body and mind. The essence and the qualities of the french fries topped off with the cheese is the essence and the qualities that you're bringing in too. So have everything balanced everything with balance, and everything looking at their qualities and ask yourself, what am I inviting into myself that I am now going to express outwardly? And so we're coming up now uh, on, it's about 2.39, and we're going to have uh, a moment here of PSA. Okay, sorry about that. I know, no dead air. I apologize. So we are, uh, we're we're just going to play this real quick message for you and then come back on. Okay, so getting ready for this now. And while they're getting the PSA ready, then um, you can think about, you know, the ways that you treat yourself with kindness, uh, treat yourself with compassion and the ways that you need to work on that. Yeah, wonderful. So we're going to keep talking for a moment. So just kind of recapping, asking uh, somebody what they want, ask yourself what you want, and your answer is probably going to uh, be, I just want to be happy. Spirituality calls us to our potential happiness. That's what spirituality awakens within us. It awakens happiness, and it does so because it empowers us to have good, healthy relationships in every relationship, no matter how difficult or challenging that relationship Spirituality also empowers us to recognize suffering and the role we play in that suffering. And here comes the PSA. Okay, and this is Suda, and we are back now, Spiritual Journey, talking about spirituality and mindfulness. And today our discussion is uh, defining mindfulness, defining spirituality, talking a little bit about Dharma, talking a little bit about violence and harm versus kindness and compassion about the human longing for happiness and we left off just before the psa saying that spirituality empowers us to recognize suffering to recognize suffering in ourselves and in all other beings and then we're expected to kind of do something with that knowledge with that wisdom and that is take a look at our own behaviors what might be contributing to the suffering and change those behaviors for the better so that we walk through this world less harmfully, more empathically, more compassionately, and uh, perhaps even with a little bit of a healing energy um, around us that inspires other people to find their inner healing energy as well. Now, that inner healing energy, of course, um, is a divine gift. And that's something that we will be talking about in future sessions, the relationship between healing and what it is that you have faith in, whether that's God, goddess, um, the universal consciousness, nature, whatever word or name you put to that. (coughs) Excuse me. And so we'll be talking about the relationship between these things um, in future shows. A few things that we want to... um, to also just bring to light about suffering is that 
uh, we suffer in so many different ways, you know. I mean, there's obvious suffering, like, you know, when you lose someone close to you, uh, and what we feel as a result of that loss is a deep suffering. Um, and that kind of suffering has a, a meaning to it. It's it's evidence of love, you know. It's evidence that you that you cared about this person. It's evidence that they mattered to you. But we suffer for other reasons that don't have quite so much meaning. Um, like when we uh, get to the movies five minutes late, and the movie just started, and we miss the opening lines, and we allow it to throw us into a tizzy of suffering. Um, in spirituality, we might call that drama. Uh, you know, when when we try to get tickets for a concert and we're just a little late and the concert got sold out and and we say, oh, my gosh, now my life will never be the same. Um, that that type of suffering is more drama oriented and it doesn't have to be that way. You can just look at it and say, OK, so, you know, I didn't get the tickets or I, I arrived at the movies late. Uh, maybe I'm meant to be doing something else in that time. Um, and, you know, maybe it was more important getting to the theater safely um, versus speeding and maybe having an accident on the way. We can always look at things in the brightest possible light. And I don't mean through rose-colored glasses. Rose-colored glasses are looking at life and denying. We're not denying anything. We're just saying, you know, hey, maybe things are the way they are for reasons that go beyond my understanding. And, um, and if I'm open to the possibility of it, maybe the night of the concert, something else magical will happen. Maybe something, some other opportunity will come up that will have far more meaning for me. But in order for me to see that and recognize that, I need to cut the drama and open the eyes and heart to the possibilities of it. Life is only what we make of it. It is only what we make of it. So let's make something great of it. So we're coming up on 245. And at this point, uh, I have to play a couple of songs for you. So I'm going to leave you with this thought. Life is what you make of it. Um, and so just take this next few minutes while these amazing artists are uh, being played and maybe make a little mental list for yourself of what it is that you want to make out of your life and how it is that you would like to empower your spirituality. So here we go. Enjoy the music. Hello, hello. This is Suda again, uh, here with Spiritual Journey and talking with you today about spirituality and mindfulness and introducing this new program on WXAC 91.3 FM. Uh, I'll be on uh, every Wednesday from 2 to 3 and talking with you about different aspects of spirituality and different traditional perspectives and personal reflections, um, providing you some practice opportunities and uh, just, you know, maybe even answering your questions. So if you if you have questions that you would like to have addressed, you can always message them to me um, at s-a-l-l-i-t-t at allbright.edu. Um, I'm one of the chaplains here at the college, and I'm really honored to be able to talk with you uh, during this hour. So I'd like to end our time today. Um, by just recapping again, uh, you know, that we are all spiritual beings. Um, we are spiritual inherently because we are alive, and we are having this experience of life, this experience of life which on some level and in some part is what we make of it. Of course, things happen that we cannot control. Um, we can't control anything outside of ourselves, but we can control our responses, and our reactions to things. And so if we can come into a deeper state of understanding, of compassion and kindness, if we can empower our hearts to open to the possibility, the possibilities of goodness, the possibilities of our own wholeness and the wholeness of all those around us, including non-humans and, and the world itself, you know, the earth herself, if we can open up to that, <clears throat> then we are also in the same moment opening up to a greater spirituality, a spirituality that is founded and grounded in oneness. Oneness is something that we talk about a lot in spirituality, and many times people say, what does that mean exactly? The first level of oneness is just acknowledging that, you know what, as human beings, we are all the same in that we all suffer, 
we all don't want to. And what we're seeking, what our heart is longing for is happiness. And then we can go beyond just the human experience and we can look at non-human animals and say, well, they don't want to suffer either. Um, and they really just want to thrive. You know, that's the natural instinct of any biological organism is to thrive. And so we have this in common. And the earth herself just wants to thrive. She just wants to express herself through her seasons and her seeds and her creation, maintenance, and destruction. She just wants to thrive and continue her process. So in our spirituality, we come to a place where we acknowledge that we really all have this very important sameness, that we all suffer, none of us want to, and we all long for happiness. So on that note, I will invite you to take some time this week to contemplate on your personal definition of happiness. What is it that you feel would make you happy from the inside? Not what you can get that will make you happy from the outside. But what is it inside of yourself that you can support the awakening of in order to realize a deeper and more meaningful happiness? And as that happens, just watch and see if it doesn't lead to a natural understanding of what oneness is. Because in that place of happiness, it's so easy and simple to simply accept what we all share, what we all have in common, what we call oneness. So, I will sign off by saying I'm sending you all so many blessings and so much love. I have so much faith in you and in your goodness and in your path in this life. And I am holding so much space for you all in this moment. I thank you for being here with me today. So much love. Namaste.